Patrick Arkin. I have a skin name, Jagaman. I belong to the Warramunga peoples from my mother and from my father. I belong to Wanyu people in, in Queensland. And I, I'm an AHP. I've been one for over 40 years, 41 years. And I work in, in um, social alcohol, drugs, volatile substance at the moment. And, and Natsuwa is very important, very close to your heart, isn't it? It certainly is. I mean, I, 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 I guess that, um, you know, being recognised or nationally recognised are the things that that we as health practitioners in the Northern Territory didn't think would, we would be. Um, so, yeah, it's been really close and being a, um, honoured to be a local member of Natsuwa. Um, at a meeting in Alice Springs um, quite so many years ago, over 10 years ago. And I understand that you actually helped to design the Natsuwa that we have now. I wonder, does it fill you with pride when you see what it's doing, what it's up to? Um, I think the, the logo was very easy to do. I mean, I, I just sat there during Sydney at a workshop in Sydney or Melbourne and and I came up with that design. And it's just just listening to people talk and, and um, seeing who's around the table and Torres Strait Island mob and, and that sort of thing. And I, I thought it was really good to to incorporate those and, and to incorporate that colour of blue and green in Torres Strait as well. You've been in this sector for many, many decades. Give us a bit of a sense of your career. Well, I, I um, in 1982 I left Darwin. Uh, I'm born and bred in Darwin, but there was there was half half of every time I looked in the mirror there was only half of me. I always knew who my father's side was, but getting visitors from mum's side, they were dressed in desert clothes and they spoke a language that wasn't top end language. And so one day in 1982 I walked into the desert. I didn't mean to take 35 years, but I found all my family. <laughs> and um, oh, it's just really great. I mean, I, I um, look in the mirror now and I see me. And but it's just really good to have that connection, knowing both sides of my family. And, and just and I end up marrying a Walpuri lady and becoming a Walpuri ceremonial man at a place called Wallara, which is about 100 kilometres up, up, up on top of the end of it. About, um, Yes, really good experiences around around that. But I, I actually, somebody in 1982 said to me, hey, brother, you're going to be a health practitioner. <laughs> I would have said, yeah, what are you smoking, mate? So so it's really um, it's really funny how that happens. And, and for a lot of people that end up in a profession that they really enjoy, it, 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 it's strange how it happens sometimes. I had no intentions of <laughs> of um working in the health sector but here i am 41 years later and you know worked in a lot of re remotest communities and congress and anganini congress and whirly whirl and jang and now in me watch so i've covered a lot of territory i've met a lot a lot of elders and a lot of good people and and really importantly a lot of co ahps that some are not around now and yeah some are just starting out which is really good what does it mean to you to be an aboriginal health practitioner oh look i i just think it's 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 misunderstood a lot of our profession i i just think that um um quite often when we're working with uh, really experienced people when we come in or ahp comes in we give we give that family or the client and the family that um, a nurse is working with we, we have that ability to help them get another uh, five or six outcomes that wouldn't have happened if we didn't walk in the room so there's a lot of things that we do that are, are clinical and, and there's a lot of things that we do that are, are non-clinical and being a clinician, it sounds really funny that I have really strong values about getting a lot of um, 
uh, outcomes in that non-clinical field because I think if we do that it makes the health centre look deadly. <laughs> Steve, you know that you said you were you'd look in the mirror and only see half of yourself and then after connecting with that other side of the family you look in the mirror and you see your whole self how important is that for your sense of self oh i, I think it's really important and i think there's a story there for someone you know if somebody hears that story <laughs> how i tell it exactly how i tell it i just looked in the mirror and seen half of me i think a lot of people are like that and particularly people who have been um, moved away from their cultural domains where, where once upon a time they did thrive and they would, they went full speed ahead. And, and I think it's really important that people acknowledge that um, even today there's, you know, obviously in the 1982, I, I, I looked in the mirror and I seen that and, and I was able to do something about it. But it, it, but it is really important. I, I just think it's to feel whole and to feel or everything, I, I think it's really, really important. And I think from a social, emotional wellbeing point of view, I think um, people who haven't got that ability or have, don't know who to talk to about these types of stories, I think it can go from being social, emotional wellbeing into mental health. So I think it's really important that we address it at that level. What does a day in your life and, and work look like now? I have a 41 years experience of being a practitioner. I'm also a, a, an educator by trade. I've got a diploma in education. I've got a diploma in dual diagnosis. Um, and I, I just, um, you know, all the training stuff, I've had qualifications around all that sort of stuff. But it's sort of like um, I... I am um, as as much as I can say I'm still the right side of 60 I st I'm still keen to learn and I'm still keen to uh, read things uh, have a look at things so when I read things someone puts a document in front of me and I'm reading about motivational interviewing and strength-based approach and all this stuff and I say oh I've been doing that for 20 years <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, and it's sort of like it, and and it really is. I mean, I, I just think it's the, it's that, it's that motivation, that is the key word in in any, in any phase of life. People are motivated. I, I, I think things can change, and things can change for the better. It strikes me that that when you were younger and looking in that mirror and seeing half of yourself, that you're probably seeking out mentors and the storytellers do you feel like you're on the other side of that now that you're the the yeah. mentee and the storyteller yeah so I, i've had people you know like um I, I used to be part of NAO before become nacho and so all um uh, bruce mcginnis mob and, and uh, naomi myers mob and sol belair mob and uh, all, all the mob that were involved in health centers in the NAO days. I, I had a couple of mentors from way back there, and it was just really good to be able to bring someone up um, like Mr. McGuinness and, and 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 ask him a whole range of things that, and and they were able to talk to me really well because I was only really young when I was in in representing um, Central Australia uh, in Naha, which which was re very powerful in those days. I mean, I think um, one of the, one of the things about Nacho now, I don't think we we talk amongst each other enough. I don't think we do it often. Mm. I think we, we're a little bit separated. We're all community control, but we we should be dialoguing a bit more, particularly around AHPs and around things like the scope of, a, a clinical scope of practice for AHPs, um, I, I think, if that can happen in my lifetime, um, I'd be working in other places um, like Queensland and New South Wales and Western Australia. If we had a national scope of practice around clinical, I think that would be great. What does the National Day of Recognition mean to you? 
I, I, I think it means a lot. And, and I think if you look back in, in history, um, you will see from my point of view, I, I, um, I look back in history and I look at this group of blackfellas that went from the Northern Territory down to task force in South Australia. And, and so that's my late brother, John R. Kitt and Tommy Kelmer and Mickey Adams and Echo Coles and the late Puggy Hunter and those people that left Darwin and went down there, came back and they actually blazed the trail for us. And so they became leaders in their own rights in, in whatever field they end up choosing. Obviously, in my brother's case, it was a politician. But, um, yeah, so I, I just looked at it as, as really groundbreaking stuff. And I think that we are now, the cycle has turned again. So we're hoping that people will be looking at people like me and um, people who have been in the system for a while to be able to, you know, through our, our, our progression and our storytelling and, and how we are able to um, join in a discussion and, and give a, a, a different point of view, if you like, around health and health outcomes. How does it feel for you when me and others in the community say thank you? Thank you for your contribution. Oh, look, I, I, um, it's just a really, it is a really small world. I mean, I go to this workshop in Darwin recently about a national workshop around social and emotional wellbeing, and I get caught up talking to this person, and he's, and then he says during discussion, oh, you gave that keynote speech in Hobart <laughs> at the Oka Conference. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, I said, why is that relevant? And he said, well, the way you talk about non non um, clinical competencies, it just I just put two and two together and just oh, that was you talking. I'm saying yeah. So again, I I think it's really um, I I just don't know how we we get more recognition because um, I mean with I mean I'm part of the stolen generation and. Years ago, I, if somebody talked about stolen generation, I'd just get turned red and that door in my brain would slam shut. <laughs> but I, I've left it open and years, a few years later, all the traffic goes through. And one day I just stood up and I just said, I'm not a victim. I still get emotional when I talk about stolen generation. I could talk about stolen generation on any platform in the world. I just leave the anger behind. And it's sort of like those sort of stuff. But if we don't uh, get invited to do presentations more and more, I, I think uh, people like me will, well, we can't hang on forever, so we will retire, you know. And, and obviously I've planned for that day where I'm not going to be a clinician. When I ha hang up my hat, I'm going to be a um I'm still going to be a, someone in, in Aboriginal health. And in terms of NATSUA, I'm still an Aboriginal health worker that works in that very important field of health. So one of the things that I, I really, really push is, is that from blackfellas like myself being sick, we've created a multi-billion dollar industry. Multi-billion dollar industry. So how do we get... Um, access into there. What are the pathways? Can we spell them out a little bit better? Can governments and non-government organisations really assist us in making sure that there are pathways for our, our, particularly our younger ones to get a foot in the door of that, that multi-billion dollar industry? Well, when you talk about that Part, those pathways in and that those younger mob what advice do you have for them about wanting to become aboriginal torres strait islander health workers or practitioners well i, I mean i'm not i'm not biased i mean i just say oh, i want you to put your foot in the door of health if you become a health practitioner great but if you become a scientist or a doctor or a nurse or or a health promotion or public health person that's even better you know, so I don't. I, I think that um, there's this whole thing out there that um, that um, 
we just need to get our mob in pathways through the door. And, and I think once we get them up to a certain level in education, then we need to say really seriously, where do you want to go? And where, where do you want to go? And then we, we put supports around them and get them into appropriate courses and get people studying at the higher levels. And I think that that um, one day someone's going to say, you know what, this cultural competency that we learn in ceremonies, that's going to one day align over here to a Western model of <laughs> of education. Because that, as you know, I mean, um, and you'd appreciate this, is a lot of Aboriginal people, male and female, that come out of cultural domains, we double learn. You know, so we, we go to high school and university in whitefellow law, but we also go to high school and university in blackfellow law. And so that's all the status stuff, and it's very, very important that that people acknowledge that. And I think one day someone will, and, you know, my father-in-law from Mulero, he had four PhDs in Aboriginal law. It's just not recognised in, in a Western system. But the amount of knowledge that those elders have is just mm. massive. It's off the charts. <laughs> Any any advice for younger mob coming in about maybe some of the how to navigate some of the challenges or whatnot? Yeah, I, I, I think the challenges are is that we've got to be able to um, step outside of us, as outside of us, and have a look and say, oh yeah, I, I need to improve here and here, here and here, and and so I, I guess um, young people, um, everyone growing up. I mean, I. Probably had enough smokes and going here for three lifetimes and about five lifetimes of alcohol. But at 22 years age of age, I became I've been drug free since 1984. <laughs> so, so and and it's just and I don't say to people become drug free. I just say to people have a look at where you want to go, and if um, if um, alcohol and other drugs gets in the way, then you need to be able to not stop it, but you need to be able to get on top of that problem or, or you need to be able to get on to top of that issue really quickly so it doesn't um, fly off the handle or you don't lose your way. But 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 I think that um, I think that if I had the support that's here today, I'd probably be, be a little bit higher in terms of my formal qualifications in 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 a western sense um, <laughs> so i i am um, i just really conscious who i talk to sometimes because i i could read an article and i could say oh look if you change that paragraph and that wording and change that's actually me talking you know so someone's plagiarized me or whatever that is but but i can generally look at stuff and and that, and I appreciate that that um, you know people got to study at the higher level. They're going to come and and talk with people like me that have got years and years of experience in operational and in, in that side sort of side. And and we're very um, we're very straightforward or upfront in terms of why programs succeed and why programs fail and I don't like going to meetings talking about programs that fail because I keep saying <laughs> how about we talk about those programs that are still going that stand the test of time what's in them and why do they keep going and uh, what changes do they make and all that sort of stuff I don't think do enough of and I think if you look at the why those programs are still going you'll see five or six things in those programs that, that will just say, wow, we've overlooked them so easily.